He's had 25 years of experience in computers and electronics. He's worked for several companies in that field, Hamilton Sunstrand, Motorola, Rockwell, some of the best. A lot of his specialty has involved doing embedded control programming, mostly in the C language, so he's got a really good handle on the computer end of things. But he is now becoming one of our country's best experts on gravity phenomena and gravity control. He went to a 1998 conference with uh, Richard Hoagland and Tom Bearden up in Seattle, and at that point he got hooked on this stuff, and so he's been researching it intensively, and he's got a tremendous amount of good information to pass on to us. So here's William Alec. Can you hear me now? Okay. You should be fine. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I've been exploring spark gaps, energy and spark gaps. And let's see. Is this? The left one is page forward. Page forward? Okay. Yeah, back in January, I asked a very simple question. Okay, is there excess energy coming from spark gaps? Okay, and this began my quest. Uh, back in 2003, uh, some of you may have uh, checked out Jean-Louis Naudin's website, and he did an experiment with uh, tungsten cathode, stainless steel anode mesh, using potassium carbonate electrolyte solution, and applying some DC voltage to this system. And he reported uh, an overunity effect, a COP of 1.2. This is a circuit diagram here. Uh, it's fairly simple. You know, it's just a, a transformer connected to a full wave bridge rectifier capacitor. Uh, he used a simple uh, ammeter and a uh, voltmeter. And uh, he's just applying his high voltage to the, uh, to the cathode which is made of tungsten, a solution of, uh, it's electrolyte solution, and a uh, stainless steel anode. And he observed this overunity effect. And then I uh, looked into what uh, Bruce Peralt was doing. Uh, okay. Okay, I uh, looked into Bruce Peralt's research. Uh, this was also back in 2003. And uh, he was exploring plasma uh, technology. Uh, this is Bruce's circuit here. Uh, it's a, what he called an, eight, an radiant energy circuit, a receiver, which used a uh, field antenna, diode, a couple of capacitors, uh, a transformer, okay, that stepped down to voltage. And then he also had this ion valve which uh, caught my curiosity. So I thought that, well, maybe this is something similar to what Jean-Louis Naudin was doing. Yeah, this is a picture of the Peralt valve. And it's an open air valve. And it uses a, um, so like a cylindrical um, anode with a, uh, a rod of, uh, well, that could be a tungsten rod cathode, and uh, Bruce kind of developed a plasma theory behind uh, uh, what was going on in his device. And this provided me with an opportunity to do some of my experiments, maybe trying to replicate some of his work. So then I ended up using, uh, okay, for the, uh, for the cathode, um, this tungsten rod, with a uh, anode, uh, uh, just an ordinary steel pipe, you know, I picked up at Home Depot. And I just built this assembly. It's open to the air. You see a little uh, hole drilled at the end there, right next to the tungsten rod. So the valve is really open to the air. I then needed a high voltage source, you know, to apply to this system. Here's a variety of valves that I built and tested. 
So they come in a, a variety of diameters. This is my high voltage generator. Just an ordinary Windshurst generator. Generates up to 75,000 volts DC. It's a DC voltage. Uh, the bottom diagram, bottom part of the diagram there shows two lighting jars, which are essentially capacitors. Uh, the circuit is completed there on the bottom of the, uh, of the diagram. Uh, you'll see a large spark gap that's adjustable, okay? And above that are all the collector plates for collecting all the static electricity. And there's quite a, uh, it, it, it packs quite a punch. It, I mean, it's low energy static electricity, but it's perfect for testing these valves. So my Wimshurst generator is cranked by hand. You know, it generates a 75,000 DC volts. It's low energy. You know, and it, it's perfect for these valves. So here I show two diagrams. Diagram on the left is my uh, test platform. See that on the table over here. Um, it shows no valve, but the diagram on the right shows the Peralt valve that I'm testing. And what you find here that the two terminals on the bottom, I now connect to T1, which is a step-down transformer. I have a little diode there. S1 is a switch. And then I can switch either towards a uh, LED, green, uh, little green LED light, or I can charge up a capacitor and then essentially measure the energy. So I was most really curious on the energy output of the Peralt valve. So here, this is my test result of the Peralt valve. I discovered that all those valves, they tested under unity compared to not using the valve, you know, as I charge up the capacitor, that gave me a baseline energy level. Okay, I insert the Peralt valve into the circuit. That's the only thing that changes. I, I then run my test again, identical test. And I discovered that the resistance, it's a positive nonlinear resistor, which is essentially you know, how you can model a spark gap. So all the Peralt valves tested under unity. So now what? I then had a, a web-based teleconference with Stefan Hartman of overunity.com. And Stefan looked into uh, maybe some of you heard of the Newman motor, Joe Newman motor. And Stefan mentioned that Newman used a, a bank of these carbon rods, of up to eight of these carbon rods. So Stefan suggested replacing the steel, okay, with carbon graphite gouging rods, but keep the uh, tungsten rod in there. And then he also suggested, just as in the Newman motor, okay, placing these rods in series and uh, see what happens. So I ran the test. Now, I then did a little bit of homework here. And back in 98, Jean-Louis Naudin did some replication of the Newman motor. Okay, and he made some interesting discoveries here. A commutator, typically in a motor, okay, uses carbon graphite brushes, okay, on carbon tracks. And a commutator is essentially a mechanical diode, okay? All motors, they're all AC. They all output AC. But a commutator is a mechanical diode, which then gives you the DC motor input or output capability. But according to Stefan, okay, uh, Newman used an array of eight of these brushes, but also Jean-Louis Naudin discovered that the effect seems to be enhanced with a bumpy surface, you know, that, that was the language he used, or a broken surface. So I thought, well, this is a key effect here. So then now I have a, uh, I set up my little test apparatus here using a carbon graphite rod Okay, shown, shown there at the, the center 
top diagram there, and the tungsten rod, okay, to the left there, that yellow red device there, that's a step down transformer, and then I have my switch, and then I charge up a capacitor, you know, a pretty high quality uh, film capacitor, and I just read the voltage. And you can determine what the energy stored in that capacitor is, you know, just by a simple equation, E equals one half CV squared. So then here's another photo of the test platform. Shows all the components, you know, of the system. You know, there's the carbon graphite rod and, you know, tungsten rod there to the right. Here's a close-up of the spark gap. So that little uh, ruler up there at top, it kind of gives you the scale of this. It's a quarter-inch graphite rod. And here's the electrical schematic of what, of what this whole thing is doing here. You know, the left, of course, shows without the carbon graphite rods, and then to the right, you know, so shows one rod. So then the test results, um, using a 333-turn primary coil, I, I tested a variety of coils, transformer coils, and I discovered that there's an opposite effect of the Peraltfels. Here I'm observing excess energy being stored in a capacitor. You know, I run the same identical test I did with the Peralt valves. Peralt valves ran under unity, and these carbon graphite rods run over unity. <coughs> Using the baseline energy of not having the Peralt valve or the graphite rods in place there. So then I did my COP calculation. And then I discovered, you know, what actually is the, the COP of a system like this. And just from the perspective of the carbon arc, inserting a carbon arc into the circuit, discovered a COP of 139%. So now I was thinking of, well, you know, let's, let's try out uh, some multiple uh, carbon graphite rods. Uh, try to replicate in some detail here uh, the Newman experiment. Um, just again, this is the equivalent circuit of this is, I kind of modeled this tungsten rod, the effect that I'm seeing, as a negative resistor, okay? You know, just the opposite of the Peralt valve being a positive nonlinear resistor. I think you can model this carbon arc as a uh, nonlinear negative resistor. So then I went ahead and tested multiple spark gaps. You know, see what the effect here is. Here's the wired configuration. Um, I'm able to select different configurations here using this little cable with an alligator clip. Here's the circuit diagram showing multiple carbon arcs, or carbon rods in the circuit. And here's the test results. Okay, this is for a double carbon arc system. I ran the energy calculations again. And I discovered, lo and behold, a COP of 173%. Well, I'm on a roll here, you know. I figure, well, I can add in a third and add in more energy into this system. I mean, how far can you go with this? So here's the model for a double carbon arc system showing two negative resistors. So then here's the test results for a triple carbon arc system ran the energy calculations again, and I discovered something rather interesting. The COP decreased. Okay, this is with three carbon arcs, the COP decreased. 
I was wondering, well, why is that? I kind of reasoned that, well, maybe this is an electromagnetic wave phenomenon, okay? And these waves are adding and subtracting so that when you take it from one to two, the waves are adding, but when you add in a third carbon arc, the electromagnetic waves are subtracting. You know, there's some su subtraction going on, and that leads to a lower COP. Okay, so multiple carbon arcs tested over unity. However, adding a second carbon arc in series increased the COP, but adding a third carbon arc decreased. Changes as a function of number of spark gaps wired in series. Excess energy is therefore an electromagnetic wave phenomena, which can add or subtract energy in a circuit. So this answers my first question. Okay, is there excess energy in, in these spark gaps? Yes, using the carbon arc spark gap output, outputs excess energy. But then I asked a question, well, why is that? So I did a little research there on the internet, and I discovered a couple of websites, okay, that talked about George Oshawa's experiments in transmutation of elements. And back in 65, he published this article in the East West Institute magazine called George Oshawa Transmutation Experiments stating that he produced iron, okay, from carbon, oxygen, electric arcs. And these experiments have been replicated by other researchers. And he used the medium of air and also water. So if we look at some of the water uh, carbonate solutions that Jean Louis used, um, if we just use water, then we have two mediums uh, we're getting this transmutation effect with. So then I looked a little further into transmutation phenomena. Then I discovered that nuclear binding energy, okay, the sum of the whole is always less than the sum of its parts. Okay, and you kind of think of the parts as carbon and oxygen. When you transmute into iron, Okay, the sum of the masses, okay, there's this mass difference that's radiated away to form iron, okay, and this is nuclear energy. So in this reaction, it's going to be radiating excess energy. Okay, in this chart here, this chart shows, let's see. Okay, here's iron. So for fusion processes less than iron, okay, you have fusion occurring. Okay, for masses greater than iron, you have fission, fissioning taking place. Okay, both processes involve the release of nuclear energy, you know, this nuclear binding energy. So I think this explains where this excess energy effect is coming from. And then I looked up some of the nuclear reactions occurring here. And what was discovered here is that uh, we have carbon, two carbons and two oxygens forming for a very brief period of time, nickel, which then transmutes into iron. So nickel is radioactive for about a thousandth of a second before it recombines into iron. But we also discovered that there's silicon in here, aluminum, and chromium. So this iron is a special iron. So in the experiments, it shows that in the original carbon, in those carbon rods, we have two parts per million of iron. But after you perform this electric arc process, it was discovered that you have 50 to 200 parts per million, okay, in the carbon residue. So Fe in the carbon residue was also analyzed, okay, for an abundance of various isotopes. Now besides iron, we have the silicon, nickel, aluminum, and chromium. And this is a very high quality stainless steel, is it? 
turns out to be. Okay, so for this nuclear reaction, you know, the transmutation is stainless, okay, which means that it doesn't rust easily. Okay, and we have this chemistry going on, and it's been carefully analyzed, okay, by a number of agencies. I mean, they pretty well backed up this process. And so this new form of iron is called George Oshawa steel. Okay, and you can do an internet lookup on that. So my conclusion is, is that the carbon arc spark gaps produce excess energy, okay, and I can collect that excess energy in this, in this low energy nuclear fusion process. And secondly, there's a byproduct produced, which is this high quality stainless steel. So then what's next? Okay, well, this led to a next generation device. You know, going from simple experiments, okay, to a device that allow me to harness this excess energy and produce this steel byproduct. So then I had the smart pack device that I built, oh, back in 2002. And so I adapted uh, this carbon arc system, you know, to the smart pack system. And up here uh, shows the, uh, the transformer and two carbon arcs because that's where I found the greatest COP with two arcs. So then SmartPak, it does, uh, it's basically a battery management system. Calculates COP in real time, uses a little microcontroller, okay, reads currents and voltages. This is a picture of the double carbon arc system. You see that yellow tubular running on the perimeter there? That's the secondary transformer, okay? And the primary of the transformers in red. And that's about maybe 10 or 15 turns of 16 gauge. The yellow wire, well, the yellow taped wire uh, is about 22 gauge, 600 turns. Okay, so I step up the voltage for those carbon arcs. And this is a diagram of the, uh, the smart pack system with what I call the X-Pod. Okay, that's this double arc system. And how it calculates COP in real time and calculates the delta power. And I'm still working on this system, so I don't really have any results yet. Um, I'm actually working on a software for that microcontroller. So, that concludes my discussion on the uh, SmartPak XPod system. Um, I just want to spend a few minutes here uh, talking about another project we're working on. Um, we're, we're looking at building a community of researchers, privately funded, okay, to build these devices. And these devices include energy devices, anti-gravity, gravity, temporal, that kind of phenomena. And we're looking to build a place, uh, a secluded, in a secluded area uh, in, in northern Arizona. And we're collecting some members here. Um, we have Gary Voss from TAP10, uh, John Hutchison, you heard of the Hutchison effect and the anti-gravity work that he's done. Um, he's going to be joining the team. Um, we have Terry Brady, Steve Ellswick from Tesla Tech, uh, Richard C. Hoagland from the Enterprise Mission, and uh, David Schwartz from the X-Genesis uh, Corporation. So this is what, what's shaping up now. And this is a future location. We call this place the ranch, also known as uh, the Dreamland Project. And this is a possible location. We're considering also other locations. And that concludes my discussion. It's the contact information here. So if there's any questions regarding the technology, I'll 
Okay. Uh, uh, we'll entertain questions if anybody would like to. If anybody has any questions for, for Bill, uh, come on over to the, uh, the staircase on uh, my left, your right. Hey, Bill, actually, I did have one quick question. Were you going to test spin some of your, uh, your you want to explain, just um, go over what you got out here? Sure. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is the experimental. This is, this is what I started with. Yeah, this is the Wimshurst generator that I purchased from Edmund Scientific about three years ago, so it was just sitting on the shelf. You know, this is my high voltage generator. And then in the center here are the carbon arcs. It's the transformer. It has a ferrite rod. Um, there's a high voltage diode here on the secondary. A little neat little uh, knife switch. And a uh, capacitor that I just measure the energy. And what I'm able to do with this uh, wired connection here is that I can configure this uh, with one, two, or no arcs at all, you know, and just run basic test. So right now the configuration here is to light this uh, LED. But what I would do is just run this for 15 seconds. Okay. And if the lighting was turned on, I mean, you can see the sparking that's occurring here. Okay, it just lights that LED. Let's see, configure there. And with two, see it runs a little quicker. But what I do is I measure the voltage, you know, for a 15 second period, you know, as this runs. And then I do my energy calculations and compute the COP. So I can switch in, you know, no, no arcs or two arcs or three arcs. And then over here is the XPod device. So going from this system here, the double arc. So this is the transformer. This is the secondary of the transformer that's wired to the double arcs and a primary. And that's all there is to it with this. And this module here plugs into my smart pack system, which then just drives the system and uh, computes the COP in real time. I'm still working on the, the software, you know, on this device. So that concludes my discussion and a little demonstration. Right? Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, okay. Uh, Bill will be here for a couple of minutes. Now, I, once uh, the next uh, presenter will be at 3 o'clock, it's going to be Forrest Pittman. Or actually, you know what? We're going to.